Good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent. To our congregation gathered here in the sanctuary and to those watching on the live stream, we invite you to join us in worship as we bring our voices, our bodies, our talents, our monetary gifts, our minds, and our spirits to celebrate in this place where heaven and earth meet and we are able to worship our Lord and King. The bulletin for this service is available on our church's website, right on the top of the homepage, www.griffin-fumc.org. There's a button right there for the Sunday bulletin. The order of worship is there, as well as the announcements for the week. Uh, I've stopped printing the hymn texts in the bulletin, and if anyone worshiping at home would like to borrow a hymnal from the church, please call the office and we'll arrange to get you a hymnal. There is a new newsletter available, looks like this. It's available in the narthex and in the hallway behind us in the, um, in the main office building. This is also available on the website right on the homepage with a link there. Uh, there are connection cards in the pews. Please fill those out and register your attendance. You can leave those in the pew and we will pick them up after the service. If you're watching online, there is an online connection card or you can just comment in the, in the comments and say that you're watching. We appreciate knowing that you're, that you're there. You are invited to bring your tithes and offerings to the designated places in the front and in the back during the organ prelude. We're trying to kind of experiment with that as a new option. You are also able to give online, of course, and you can even text to give. The details are in the bulletin and on the newsletter as well as on the website. In March, on March 21st, we will have UMW Sunday. Uh, and in preparation for that, the UMW is again offering uh, candle, uh, votive candles for a candle display. The form looks like this. It's available in the narthex as well. You can order in memory or in honor of, of anyone, and that will be um, part of the worship services on March 21st. As we prepare for today's worship service, there are a few musical places to prepare for. First of all, if you look in the center of your bulletin on the fold, you see the spiritual. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. Um, we will be singing this congregationally as a response to the gospel reading and then again as a response to the sermon. So Alicia will give us a, a key like this. And we'll sing, Jesus walked this lonesome valley. We're not going to practice uh, that now, but that will be coming. So just be, be ready for that as we get into the middle of the service. Then at the end of the service, the very last thing on that page, you see uh, the sending and benediction and then a response. The chancel choir is going to impress you by singing in Zulu, uh, this South African response, So Mandela. And then after we've sung it through in Zulu, you will join us and we'll sing in English. <clears throat> it's a pretty easy uh, response chorus and uh, we'll let you do it in English. Um, but it sounds like this. Just the introduction. The choir can sing with me in English. Sounds like this. We will follow, we will follow Jesus. We We will follow Jesus where he leads us. Try it with me. Ready? And we will follow, we will follow Jesus. We will follow, we will follow him. We will follow, we will follow Jesus. We will follow Jesus where he leads. We start that this week, and as we go through Lent, this will be uh, a regular response at the end of the service, so you'll have plenty of time to get familiar uh, as, we, as we go through with this. We now ask you to prepare your hearts for worship. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
During this season of Lent, we will be focusing on the disciplines of prayer and fasting and giving. During the prelude is an excellent opportunity for us to engage in those practices. I would encourage you to use this time as a, as a time of prayer. Also, we encourage that if you have a gift that you would like to bring, to bring it to the altar or to the plates in the back as an act of worship, as a way of offering the last week to God. We also would use, ask you to use this as a time to clear your mind so that you can focus on being present to God and each other. And for your help, uh, we will be listing a, a prayer that you might wish to use as a starter in this time, but today let's offer it together. God of steadfast love and faithfulness, we are humbled as we try to do what is right and walk in your ways. Receive, we ask, the offerings that we make and use them for our own good purposes in the church and in all creation. It's in, uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in our time of worship, we are greeted by the words of Psalm 25. We will also use this as a prayer of confession to unburden ourselves so that we might be emptied to receive what God has to give us today. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for, the goodness, for your goodness' sake, O Lord. For your sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. 
relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Good and upright is the Lord, and therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and decrees. The time is fulfilled. The reign of God is at hand. Repent and believe this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is number 144, This Is My Father's World. We'll stand together and sing the three stanzas. Please remain standing and join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Words are found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we invite our children forward.
Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. When I came home from work the other day, I saw these flowers blooming in my yard. I love daffodils. They are absolutely my favorite, favorite flower. And you know, some people are kind of tired of cold, wet weather and staying inside. But when I see these flowers blooming, it reminds me spring is on the way. It won't be long before weather will be warmer and we're gonna be able to play outside a lot. And seeing those flowers give me hope every time I see them. Hope's a really good thing. Hope tells us that there are better days ahead. When we don't feel well or we're tired or sad, things, there are things that are gonna give us hope. And one of those things is our Bibles and the verses in our Bibles. There are lots of Bible verses that tell us God is always with us. God always loves us. I like to read Joshua 1, 9, and it says, I've commanded you to be, strong, to be brave and strong, haven't I? Don't be alarmed or terrified because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. We always know God's with us. God loves us. Better days, warmer days are coming. And that's a really good Bible verse to learn. Miss D sitting over there. We learned that Bible verse in Vacation Bible School one year. Be strong and courageous. God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 verse 9. And I still can sing that song in my head. So I want you to remember that, that Better days are coming, always. God is always with us. God always loves us. Let's bow our heads and let's all pray together. Dear God, thank you for always being with us. Help us to remember to be brave and strong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I think Miss Heather, Heather is going to welcome us. One of our Lenten disciplines is the practice of prayer. And there are probably as many expressions of prayer as there are needs and joys and experiences in the human condition. Sometimes we, our prayers in public are different from our prayers in our homes. Uh, one of the kinds of prayers that we pray together is called a litany. A litany is a prayer where we're led uh, in a prayer, but there's a response that we all say together. And then it's followed by a time of quiet where we can lift up those petitions that are known to us. And so we pray all together, and yet we also lift up the needs that have been expressed to us or the concerns that fill our heart. And so today as we pray together, our response is, here in this wilderness, prepare your way, O God. Let's pray together. O oh God, we find ourselves in the wilderness. As much as we have tried to map and domesticate and make routine every inch of our planet and every minute of our lives, we know our maps don't tell us where we stand with you. And our schedules often serve to distract us from the reality that we ourselves and so many of our neighbors on this planet are in the wilderness too. And so we pray here in this wilderness, prepare your way, O God. Today we pray with all persons who are kept in poverty or slavery. We pray with all who live in fear from abusers and terrorists and oppressors. We pray with all who face addiction in any kind. And we pray with those who are targeted for unjust treatment just because of who they are. Here in this wilderness, prepare your way, O oh God.
In this wilderness, we pray with leaders in religious, political, economic, and social life, and with our families and friends and neighbors. We pray with all who work to sustain and protect our lives. We pray with members of the military, with essential workers and first responders. Here in this wilderness, prepare, prepare your way, O oh God. In this space of quiet, we pray with all who need your healing power. And we pray with all who offer healing through their skill and through their presence. We pray with all who have harmed us. And we pray with all whom we have harmed by our action or our inaction. We pray for those who are facing death this day and the people who care for them and those who are mourning. Here in this wilderness, prepare your way, O oh God. In the quiet of this moment, we trust that you hear the cries of our hearts, that you know our needs, even those that are hidden from ourselves. So we offer them to you as our, as our act of worship. And we ask that you might prepare us for the next thing that you would have us to receive. And now we ask once more that you hear us as we pray with all of your children using the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not in temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. We'll stand together and sing the three stanzas of number 127. standing for our gospel lesson. Our lesson today comes from Mark chapter 1 verses 12 through 15. And immediately the Spirit compelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by the accuser, and was with the wild beast, 
and the animals were ministering to him. Now, after John had been delivered into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the reign of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Our thanks be to God. Together? I'll give you a second. <laughs> here, here, wait, wait, wait. You gotta grab their bulletins a second. All right, here we go. Jesus walked that lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. Be seated. One year for Lent, I had the fantastic idea that I was going to learn to run. Uh, not the kind of run, you know, when, when there's a dog chasing you kind of run, but actually uh, concertedly trying to run for the sake of, of running. Uh, it was an odd concept to me, but I really decided that that was something that I wanted to do as a, as a physical and spiritual discipline, because if you've ever done a lot of jogging or running, you, you find that in that there's a prayerful uh, place uh, where you're so in sync with the sounds of your, your own breathing and the pounding of the pavement that it creates a, a, a place of intense prayer and, and, and closeness with God. Well, of course, uh, being the person I am, I was talking to several people that I knew who were, were runners, and, and, and some of them had even done double marathons. I was like... Uh, that's kind of sick, isn't it? But it's not the worst. There was somebody that they, they had this thing where they run 100 miles. It, it, it's an it's a, a ongoing thing that they, that they do. And it's just extreme and, and out of my thoughts. So I was asking, you know, well, well what, what's, what's the key to running a marathon? As if I would even try. And the words that scared me the most is somebody said, well, the first 20 miles are easy. And then it gets hard. You know, folks, I think we've done the first 20 miles of this last journey we've been on. And this last little stretch is going to be hard. But there's a blessing in it for us. And, and my biggest fear is not that things get back to normal, but that when things go back to normal, we allow them to become too normal again. And we forfeit the things that we should have been learning. We forfeit the ways that we have grown and changed and that we'll lose the, the compassion that we have in the suffering of people around us. And so before we go too far ahead, let's spend some time journeying together through this wilderness that we might make the most of. Now, anybody already start their Lenten disciplines if you chose to give something up? Or another? Some of us are already having a little bit of trouble uh, realizing that you know, running is hard. Uh, so let me share these words before we go any further from Psalm 46. Uh, the Psalms are becoming increasingly important to me. I just want to offer this as a gift. So I ask that you receive this in your spirit. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, Though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy inhabitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, and it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord and see what desolations he has brought to the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear and he burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, our refuge. The wilderness is the place we journey during this season. And the wilderness is a place that is pregnant with meaning. The wilderness is the place of birth. It's where the people of God were created out of a mob of runaway slaves. The wilderness is the place where people flee to safety in times of invasion and political unrest. When things get rough, head for the hills. It's a place where the prophets retreat in order to receive a new word from God. The wilderness is the place where people go to renew their covenant with God and to be reformed into God's people. The wilderness is a place of danger. It's where the unweary and the ill-prepared perish. It's where the wild and dangerous animals roam free. The scorpions and the snakes and the wolves and the lions and the bears. It's untamed and lawless place that serves as a home for bandits and zealots and thieves. The Hebrew word for wilderness is midbar. And for those reading the book of Numbers, anybody reading the book of Numbers right now? There's a phrase, bah midbar, in the wilderness, that provides the driving theme of, of the book of Numbers, our mitbah. It's almost like Mark and his immediately. Mitbar can be translated as wordless, the place where words aren't spoken. And it can mean several things. It can mean the silence that we experience in the wilderness, or it could refer to the places in our lives where God has yet to speak. The wilderness of our land can be a dangerous and wild place filled with nothingness, terror, and awful silence. But this journey can also take us to an exciting place of new birth, an opportunity as God enters into the silence of the untouched places in our lives and speaks a creative word that causes springs to erupt and life to emerge and to bloom. We often fear more than the wilderness itself, the unknown. What's out there? What will happen over these 40 days of heightened discipleship? What can I expect to find in this wilderness of Lent? Once I strip off all of the stuff, will I love the me that I discover? You see, this might be our last opportunity to redeem this last year and make it count for something. To make it have a purpose, make it have a meaning, make it to be more than just a time of suffering and loss. You know, we've been forced to slow down. And that's a shame because we like to be busy. We like to be noisy on the outside and on the inside. In fact, the quickest way to wake me up from that wonderful Sunday afternoon nap is turn off the television. What's going on? We know how to distract ourselves with our televisions and our radios and our phones and our computers. It's been a while since we've been out anywhere to eat, but one night uh, my family was out and we saw this family gathered around the table and they were all praying and, and they all had their heads down and it was an extended period of time and I was really impressed until I realized they were all on their cell phones. I texted to Katie, I said, can you believe these people? <laughs> we know how to worry about stuff. We know how to worry about things that we can't change. We, need to worry, we know how to worry about things that will never happen. And we know how to worry about the things that if they do happen, we can't change it anyhow. But we know how to worry about it. We know how to be self-absorbed, how to place our own uh, desires and preferences and feelings and thoughts ahead of everyone else. 
We know how to be, and you can fill in the blank for yourself. But what we don't know is when we've had enough. I was talking to a gentleman one time after a Bible study, and and he said something that, that really caught my attention. He said, it was the third heart attack that got my attention. Sometimes we just don't know when to to wake up, do we? He said it was the third heart attack that got my attention. We don't really know what we need to be happy. Most of us don't know when our busyness is too much. How many times have we had relationships that just slipped away without our notice? Not that anybody was angry or that anyone was, was in anything, just we lose touch. Most of us don't know when the clamor is too loud. Do you remember the last thing your spouse or child or grandchild said to you, even today? Most of us don't know when our distractions become dangerous. Thinking about where we have been and where we are going, we forget to be where we are. Anybody accidentally run a red light recently because your mind was somewhere else? I I have, and and I'm the most conscientious driver you'll see. I never speed. I always follow all the laws, and yet, one day, right through it. I was horrified afterwards, but that doesn't change it, does it? I worried about it afterwards, but that doesn't change it, does it? Most of us don't know when our worries become pathological. How many folks do you know are taking antidepressants or other medications or seeing a therapist. How many folks do you know that need to be taking antidepressants? <laughs> Some other medication and seeing a therapist. All of us have our stuff, and this year has forced us to, to look it in the eyes in a different way. You know, I think that's part of the busyness and the noise is so that we don't have to deal with ourselves. So we don't have to hear the voice of our spirit. And that maybe in some part of us, we're afraid that God will speak to us and that we won't be able to withstand it. Most of us don't know when our self-absorption became idolatry. We didn't realize when it became a sin. But most of us have crossed that line recently and often. We don't know when to stop. We don't know how to stop. We don't know how to be still. And we can't remember how to simply be. This year we've had an opportunity to find out. But this might be the last chance to make these months and experiences count for something. We have to take this last leg seriously. This is the journey that could change us for a generation. This is the journey that can change us in our culture. Listen again to these words that Jesus preached as his sermon that's found in the Gospel of Mark. He says, the time is fulfilled. Today is all that we have for certain. Right now, immediately, is where we can act and move. It's today that we can show our love for others. It's today that we can grow stronger in our faith. It's today that we can make the difference in the life of a child or an older person. It's today that we can take the next step in our lives of Christian discipleship. We have no control over what we did yesterday. And we have no real claim to tomorrow. The time is fulfilled. This is it. As the Apostle Paul says, look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of our salvation. Now is the time because it's all we have. Those ashes on our foreheads were a reminder that the clock is ticking. We only have one shot at this life, and it's today. Now is the time. God doesn't wait for the right time to speak, but because God is speaking, now is the right time. The time is fulfilled. And we are being invited to be witnesses and to experience something new and wonderful. But we have to stop and pay attention. We have to make the most of this opportunity that we've been given. And so today I ask, how has God been speaking in your heart these last months? 
on those times when you finally ran out of Netflix shows worth watching, and then the ones that aren't worth watching. What is God saying in the hours that you lay awake? What new ministries have been inspired in your soul? What superpower have you developed over this COVID season? Many of us have learned a new skill. Who's learned how to do something new? Bake bread, play a guitar, tune a piano, build a model, sing a song. You know, that's for a reason. God is giving us this opportunity to build new skills for a purpose so that when the time comes, we can put those to work. We can use those to the glory of God. I think they also were a gift to help keep us sane. But it's more than just about us. God doesn't give us gifts for our own sake, but so that we might be useful and helpful in the lives of others. So today, what word do you need to speak? What hand do you need to hold? What change do you need to make in your life? in our church, in our world. See, the time is, the time is right. The time is fulfilled because the reign of God has come near. When Jesus says this, he doesn't mean that the reign of God is some distant idea. The reign of God is not a dream or a future far off land. Heaven is not just a place we go where we die, when we die. The kingdom of God has drawn near to us and is experienced fully through the person and ministry of Jesus. In the times when we are the loneliest, in the times when we suffer, is the times that we are positioned to realize that the kingdom of God is close. The kingdom of God coming near isn't about time as we would count it on a watch or a calendar. It's about a nearness in our physicality, in our spirituality. It's about God moving to our side. As we continue the ministry of Jesus through our church, we bring that reign of God closer to the lives of others who previously had no hope. People right now who don't realize that there is a sunrise coming. People who don't realize that even though this last leg of the journey is the hardest, it does have an end. People who don't realize that we can make sense, we can make purpose, we can redeem and make some good out of all of this mess. And how are they going to know if you don't tell them? The kingdom has come in Jesus, but it awaits its final fulfillment according to God's will. If we fail to stop and pay attention, we will miss a miracle. If we aren't still, we could miss a mercy that God has positioned for us. If we don't stop focusing on ourselves, we could miss an opportunity to be a part of God's healing work in our world. If we don't return to a position where we're open to learning, we won't gain anything from all this loss. The reign of God has come near and all creation is waited with, waiting with bated breath to see what we are going to do about it. And the awareness of the kingdom very near to us causes us to repent. The first words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark is repent. And in case you missed it, that's a command. The announcement of God's kingdom has consequences in the lives of those who hear and receive this proclamation. Repentance is like that GPS recalculating when I took the wrong turn or refused to go down that dirt road. We have to wait a minute and see where we are in relation to where God is calling us to be, and then we can make the necessary corrections. This is a time to recalculate where we need to be in our ministry as a church. Repentance is uh, an ability to reprioritize our schedules, to refocus our efforts, to redirect our resources, to rededicate our lives and take that next faithful step. This year for Lent, I'm not asking you to be perfect. 
I'm not asking you to run a marathon. I'm just asking you to try with God's help to take that next step. If you're a person of prayer, maybe you can pray a little more. Maybe you can find a different style of prayer, one that suits you better in this season. Maybe you can teach someone to pray. If you're a person of prayer, maybe you can start a ministry where you pray with someone who isn't. Maybe the next time someone asks for your prayers, you stop, and instead of saying, I'll pray for you, you say, let's pray now. Maybe if you read Scripture, you'll make it a daily practice. And maybe if it's already a daily practice, you'll start sharing your reading of Scripture with others. Maybe if you're reading the Bible through a year, you'll invite a friend to join you and hold one another accountable and have someone that you could talk about, especially when you get to Leviticus. There's just so much to talk about. The proper dissection of a liver is, is incredibly important. And you'll have at least one other person in the world that knows what you're talking about. If you already give, maybe you can move to that next step. If not a tithe, maybe a step closer. And if you tithe, maybe you can start looking at giving, finding new ways to empower the ministries of the church and many good organizations in our community. Maybe if you fast, you can learn to make that a part of your life. Not just in the giving up of meals, but denying ourselves of things that we don't need. Things that might even hurt us. For the sake of being able to spend more time with people. And for the sake of being able to give more to people who don't have. We repent, not in an attempt to win God's favor. This isn't about beating ourselves up so God will love us. And if that's how you've been taught, if that's how you felt, I am sorry for that because that's a lot. Repenting is not about trying to make God love us, but it's a response to God's love. It's because God has moved in next to us. It's not a decree of judgment, but a, a desire to walk away from judgment. Jesus invites us to stop and repent because, well, it's not too late. There's still time for us to make a difference. There's still time for things to change. When we're told to repent, it means our sin is real. When we're told to repent, it means our temptations are real. When we're told to repent, it means that evil and suffering and death are real. But when Jesus tells us to repent, it also means that those things, Our sin, temptation, suffering, those are not the final word. If Jesus tells us to repent, that means that our sin is not ultimately what defines or controls us. If Jesus tells us to repent, that means that we can. This is a command and an invitation, but it's also a plural command. When when Jesus says this, he says, all y'all repent. Uh, Remember, Jesus speaks good Southern Greek. He says, all y'all repent. It's a command not directed at a person, but to a people. Repenting and believing what we do together is what we do together as a family. This isn't a message for us just as individuals. But for the people who claim the name of Jesus, it's a challenge for our church today because we're told that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has drawn near, and repent and then believe this good news. Believe the gospel. Because in Jesus, God makes it possible for God's people to do more than just rerun the past. We don't have to be victims to old patterns We don't have to return to the same old mess as we had before. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the glad tidings toward which Jesus invites us. Stop, turn, turn again, and then hold on for dear life. Because once that spirit starts moving, it's going to get real wild up in here. We're going to get all Methodistical up in hissel for shissel with a whistle. Try to say that twice. This is the gospel. That the things don't have to stay the way that they are now. 
In fact, following Jesus means that things can't stay the way they are. Now, we know in the past, our church knew how to be busy. Our church knew how to be noisy. We knew how to keep keep ourselves amused and distracted. And we certainly know how to worry. And we've had new opportunities to worry about finances, about, about attendance, about keeping connected with one another. And our church knew how to be self-absorbed and to put a big stress on our, our preferences, our likes and dislikes, our, our, our thoughts and our feelings. But we're learning that our church knows how to be still. We're learning how to listen and how to love. Now is the time. The reign of God has come near to us. So let's change and embrace that good news. Now, Jesus didn't go and begin preaching in the noisy and busy streets of Jerusalem. He didn't stand on the street corner and proclaim the good news of the nearness of the reign of God. He didn't intentionally go to the high places and preach to the sophisticated and educated people. He didn't go to the places of the powerful and the wealthy and to the religious know-it-alls. Jesus began to preach in the little towns of the Galilee, little more than docks around that lake. Jesus began to share this good news with ordinary people. In fact, he seemed to pick his disciples indiscriminately of the people who just happened to be nearby. Jesus shared his news with ordinary folk, many of which he may have already knew. Jesus preached where it was already quiet and still so that the message could be heard. Where is your Galilee? Where is the place that God is calling you to ministry right now? Where are the places you need to be listening and start to speak? How could you use this time for a holy purpose? Is there a quiet place you need to go in order to hear? Is there a place you need to go to share good news? Let's pray together and then be ready to sing. Gracious God, in rushing waters and dry wilderness, in every season and circumstance, we need your sustaining word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, proclaim the good news among us today so that we may repent, so that we may live lives of belief, that we might see anew how the time is fulfilled and how your love has come near to us in Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Jesus walk. Sorry, we must walk. Let's do it again. Sorry, my fault. We must walk. That's repenting. We must walk this lonesome valley. We have to walk it by ourselves. Oh, nobody else can walk it for us. We have to walk it by ourselves. Break from the rigors of the journey. We'll celebrate a mile marker and we'll look at a way that we can improve and take that next step in discipleship. Traditionally, for the season of Lent, the the focus is on prayer, fasting, and giving. This season, I encourage you to engage in a different form of prayer. Maybe you have always heard about Lecto Divina and you want to know what that is. Or maybe you've discovered that I like to make Protestant rosaries and teach people to pray in an ancient form of the wilderness. Maybe you've tried journaling in the past and it just didn't seem to fit, but now the words seem to flow from your pencil. This is a good time to adopt different manners of prayer. 
Maybe God is pray, it's calling you to pray while, while jogging or walking. And so whatever it is that you do, what's the next step? We're called to fasting, to setting aside our biological needs for the sake of spending more time with God and with each other. But also when we fast, we use the money that we would otherwise spend on food or on those upgrades for the games on your phone, you know, that when you get almost there, you got two moves left and it's only not $4.99 for 10 more moves. We take that money that we would spend on those things and we give it to somebody who's hungry or to somebody who needs help with their utilities. Or we use that to empower someone to tell somebody that this season isn't the end, but just the beginning of a new start. Many of you already give. And your faithfulness in, in your stewardship is evident in that we have not slowed down as a church. Even facing these horrible times, we have not scaled back our ministry. We've changed it in many ways. We've had to learn and adapt and re-explore, but the ministries of this church hasn't stopped. And that's because you haven't stopped. And we give thanks. And so now in this season, maybe God is calling you to explore how to go that next step. One step closer to a tithe one step beyond a tithe into giving. Or maybe giving in different ways. You know, the most valuable thing that most of us have is our time. How can you spend some time, maybe on Zoom, helping parents by helping the children read a book or with homework help? Or just do something to give mom and dad a 20-minute break? How about some time to call someone that you fear might be lonely? Somebody that doesn't have family nearby? Or maybe somebody is just mean and nobody likes them, and so maybe you should call them just because they need somebody to love them too. You see, this season, it's not about running a marathon. It's not about being perfect in all things. It's about taking just one more step forward. And you know, over time, that builds up. I, I'm not near the person I was five years ago, thanks be to God. And five years from now, I hope that I'm much more closer to Christ than I am now. But the truth is that doesn't happen on accident. It happens one step, one journey, one day at a time. Let's stand together and sing. And I would ask you to treat this as a prayer and as an act of praise. No one will, will laugh at you if you lift your hands. No one will laugh at you if you allow your heart to sing. Hymn is 347, the spirit song, and we'll stand together to sing the two verses. <clears throat> oh, let the Son of God enfold you his spirit and his love let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul oh let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you
and sadness. Give him all your years of pain, and you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. sing that chorus just one more time. I'm, I'm sorry? Can we sing the chorus just one more time? Chorus one more time. One more time? There, there was somebody that, that really wanted an opportunity to lift their hands. <laughs> and so, yeah. Ready? Together. So It was the Spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness. That same Spirit has brought us here as well. Settle in. Allow the wilderness to work in you and on you. Make strange companions. Endure the trials. And trust in the angels that God will send to minister to you. And learn the way of Jesus. Now be at peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, where he leads all.